Good morning. If you bear with me, I've been running from a cold all week, and I think it's catching up with me. Um, I would like to thank President Lindsay for that wonderful and very warm uh, introduction. It really is a privilege um, and an honor to be here at Gordon College. Um, I thank him for the invitation. Uh, President Lindsay, as you know, is a gifted and very gracious leader. And as, as some of you may know, uh, leading a college requires not only kind of instilling a vision and being kind of brilliant and encouraging people, but a lot, large part of the responsibility of a college president is to fundraise. And uh, President Lindsay is a great fundraiser. But his wife, Rebecca, when uh, I received a letter from her, I wrote a check. So I just want you to know, even in her absence, I want to recognize her as a phenomenal partner to Michael and actually a great champion of Gordon College and one of your best kept secrets. So uh, just want to acknowledge her. And I do want to thank my pastors for being here, Pastor Ray and Pastor Gloria. When I got word that they were going to be here, I was thinking, I'm speaking to a thousand or so students, um, but now I feel the pressure. Uh, and another dear friend, Marcia Kim, may be in the audience. Oh, she is. She drove up from Boston. She heads up our Sunday school program at Bethel, so that's a blessing to have her here. And her son, Matthew Kim, is a, a junior here, and so it's good to have Matthew in the audience. Oh, you, know, you guys know Matthew. <laughs> um, so this is a true privilege, and I don't take lightly the fact that you came out this morning because I went to a women's college, uh, Spelman College in Atlanta, Georgia, and we had the requirement of being in chapel every Tuesday and Thursday morning. So the fact that you rolled out of your beds and made your way here for 10 o'clock a.m. to be in convocation, I am so appreciative. Uh, this morning's topic, Between Justice and a Hard Place, um, how apropos, even though I hadn't planned it, but that it falls on this Martin Luther King um, birthday celebration weekend and also the weekend of the inauguration of uh, President Obama. Between Justice and a Hard Place. In August of 1963, Fannie Lou Hamer was hauled off to jail in Winona, Mississippi. Her offense, at the age of 44, for the very first time in her life, she'd attempted to register to vote. She didn't see herself as an activist um, because only until the prior year um, had she just learned that African Americans in the Mississippi Delta had the right to vote. She began to organize during that year with the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And so vested in sharing this message and advocating for change, some deemed her extremely brave, given that she would put everything at risk, home, family, safety, comfort, for the likes of people many she knew and many more she would never know. When she boarded the bus heading to the courthouse, she was not alone, but rather accompanied by others hoping for change. Once at the courthouse, she'd been required to read a copy of the Mississippi Constitution, answer questions about it, and provide her name, her full name, her address, and place of employment. Incidental details, except for the terror of late night Klan rides and the fear of losing her job. Despite lingering fears, she completed the requisite forms, and she and her group headed back home. On the way there, however, they were pulled over by officers, arrested and jailed. The night's events would soon turn gruesome. Naming her the quote-unquote troublemaker, the one responsible for disrupting good Southern respectable life, jailers came to her cell last. As she waited, she saw her friends one by one carted off to an area just beyond her cell, and then heard the thumps of a crowbar bearing into the bodies of Anna Ponder and 15-year-old June Johnson. For 15-year-old Johnson, the sheriff, the chief of police, the highway patrolman, and another unidentified white male, quote, threw her to the floor, beat her, and stomped on her body until her clothes were soaked in blood. Hamer heard their screams. 
When Heimer's turn came, instead of beating her themselves, the police officers forced two black male inmates to levy her punishment. When she looked up at them and asked, how could you do this to your own flesh and blood, the jailers immediately interrupted, reminding the men that their punishment would be much more severe if they did not carry out hers. For the next excruciating moments, the men took turns beating Hamer with a blackjack. As one got tired, the other one would commence. Over her screams, the jailers hurled insults. And while she survived the beating, it became, as historian Charles Marsh described, Hamer's, quote, Damascus Road experience, the moment at which she knew that she could not back down from her pursuit of justice. In his classic text, God's Long Summer, Stories of Faith and Civil Rights, historian Charles Marsh tells us this story in the context of the summer of 1963, when all hell broke loose across the South. We could say hell in chapel. Fannie Lou Hamer's story and that of countless others is instructive because it tells us something about justice. And that is that the pursuit of justice is often costly. For many, the pursuit of justice has been hemmed between two wrenching alternatives, death and slavery. Hamer, like King and others before her, chose to confront the looming shadow of death. Her tormentors, the men who actually beat her, some could even understandably see why they chose slavery instead. That night in jail left an indelible mark on Hamer as she once said, quote, I'm never sure anymore when I leave home whether I'll get back or not. Sometimes it seems like to tell the truth today is to run the risk of being killed. But if I fall, I'll fall five feet, four inches forward in the fight for freedom. The freedoms you and I enjoy today as Americans of every race, religion, culture, you as immigrants and natural born citizens, these freedoms that we enjoy come because people paid the ultimate sacrifice. It's not the road best lit, I would surmise, nor the easiest to travel, but in the end, it is the road that bends towards justice that leads us closer to God. In Psalms 89, 14, the psalmist writes these words, the foundations of your throne, O God, are righteousness and justice. I've always been struck by that passage because it seems that the two, righteousness and justice, are for an ever entangled in a mutual condition of dependency. Indeed, scholars suggest that the two words here are almost interchangeable. In other words, it's nearly impossible to have one without the other. One scholar opined that only in the Western world where we establish dualities of public and private do we try to move fervent, try to most fervently create a distinction between personal righteousness and social and political justice, public justice. Yet the scriptures do not make such contrasting distinctions. Translated, if we think we're righteous and yet tolerate injustice, we may just be like the children of Israel, whom the prophets were constantly warning against their lack of affection and concern about the poor and oppressed among them. Yet, if we fancy ourselves champions of justice, too often we forsake the call of righteousness that God has on all of our lives, and we make a mockery of Christ and his atoning and transforming power. Indeed, in a number of accounts, the scriptures tend to link the concepts of justice and righteousness. On numerous occasions, we find the ideas expressed jointly. Psalms 103.6 says, the Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. Psalms 33.5 says, God loves righteousness and justice. Isaiah 5.16 says, the Lord of hosts is exalted in justice, and the holy God shows himself holy in righteousness. And Psalms 99.4 says, you have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. And watch what the New Testament self has to say. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin. In other words, you give a tenth of your salaries. You do the righteous thing with what you have. But you've neglected the more important matters of the law, 
justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter, get this, without neglecting the former. Jesus wants us to hold the two in tension. And even as the scriptures join the two, we find ourselves at a crossroads. American Christianity has at times made much of righteousness at the expense of justice and at times made headways on justice, forsaking the ever-demanding cry of righteousness. And too often our righteousness is in high gear because we're in pursuit of tangible rewards. I study prosperity gospels for a living, one of the many things. And the idea that you can give something to God in anticipation of a blessing in return, this idea that God is in a contractual relationship with the giver, and he's obligated to give something back in return. All over the world, these prosperities, gospels are emerging in South, Af South America, in West Africa, in East Africa, in Europe, in Australia. We see various iterations of this gospel. And I used to think that this is a strange anomaly of the Christian faith, that it simply came out of the New Thought movement and translated itself into the word of faith and then became some elements of the charismatic movement and then seemed to proliferate on televangelism. But I've now come to fully appreciate the ways in which even more widely accepted evangelical theologies border at times on the same premise especially as it relates to how we communicate sexuality to young people. Christine Gardner, in her book, Making Chastity Sexy, argues that, quote, evangelicals are using sex to, quote, sell abstinence, shifting from a negative focus on just say no to sex before marriage to a positive focus on just say yes to great sex within marriage. Sex, along with marriage, is presented as the reward for abstinence. But what if there is no marriage? And what if the marriage ends in misery? Is that a reason to question why one lives in holiness and righteousness if the reward doesn't work out? I've learned even in my own life that the reason we offer our bodies, our money, our time, any and all that we have to God is not because we're expecting something back in return. If we do get something that's icing on the cake, but it's not because we anticipate something back that we sacrifice, but it, we do it simply because it's our reasonable service. Romans talk about, I, receive, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. In other words, after all that God has already done for us, how much is it to really ask that we live out our lives in righteousness? And the same can be in our, true in our pursuit of justice. We don't pursue justice because it's going to provide us admiration and awards and recognition. We do it because it's our reasonable service. It's what God expects of us. When Fannie Lou Hamer and Martin King and Medgar Evers and countless others pursued justice, even to the point of death, they did it because they were following the voice of God. And this is how our faith works. Hebrews 12 tells that us that some died not having received the promise, and yet they were faithful. Our pursuit of righteousness and justice is ultimately fixed in our pursuit of God. And how do we avoid being like the Pharisees, practicing the latter while neglecting the former, having one without the other? If these two are mutually dependent upon one another, how might they alter the way we think about the walking out of our faith in everyday life? How do we do justice and righteousness? If we take, it the lot, take a look at the lives of people like Fannie Lou Hamer, I believe that her life is instructive. And here I want to suggest briefly three things that we can learn from the lives of great men and women of faith that can help us kindle our passion for justice. One is I believe they had the perspective of hindsight. They had the perspective of hindsight. Often doing the work of justice is a process of righting the wrongs of history. And the only way to right a wrong is to actually know it. 
We have a way of telling history in this country that sanitizes its reality. Anthropologist Michelle Roth Trio in his work, Silencing the Past, Power and the Production of History, argues that, quote, in vernacular use, history means both the facts of the matter and the narrative of those facts, both what happened and that which is said to have happened. A romantic history, however, is not a liberating history. We as Christians know that it's only the truth that sets us free. What would it be like if we collectively as a nation revisit the history of prisons and the prison industrial complex, an institution that has decimated black and brown communities across the country for decades? How powerful it would be if all of us as Christians read Elizabeth Alexander's groundbreaking work, The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in an Age of Colorblindness. What if we all read her work and began to think about and challenge the ways in which our laws and legal systems and elected and appointed officials have conspired both knowingly and unknowingly against poor black and brown people, men and women alike, and have decided that they are not worthy of a future and a hope? What if all of the states were like California and New York who are revisiting this war on drugs and revisiting their stop and frisk policies? What if we challenged that history of prisons? What might it look like if we all revisited the ways in which our economy has shifted from what some might deem a responsible 20th century capitalism to what scholars now call a period of late capitalism or neoliberalism where so many of our relationships, even our most intimate and altruistic and spiritual ones are enmeshed in economies of monetary exchange. What would it be like if we revisited the histories of women in this country and around the globe and tried to make lasting impact on the various forms of gender discrimination and oppression? One scholar has done this in her work at the dark end of the street, a new history of the civil rights movement. Danielle McGuire argues, quote, that the rape of black women by white men continued often unpunished throughout the Jim Crow era, a carryover from slavery. What if we all knew that Rosa Parks didn't go to Alabama to sit on a bus? but she went to document the stories of black women in the South who'd been raped, and she went to advocate for change for them. McGuire says that, quote, the real story that the civil rights movement is also rooted in African-American women's long struggle against sexual violence has never been written. The stories of black women who fought for bodily integrity and personal dignity hold profound truths about the sexualized violence that marked racial politics and African-American lives during the modern civil rights movement. If we understand the role of rape and sexual violence, that the role that it played in African-Americans' daily lives and within the larger freedom struggle, we have to reinterpretate, reinterpret, if not rewrite, the history of the civil rights movement. Can we tell that story? Or is it too impolite or does it make us too comfortable? Even this morning I was thinking, do I really want to include that in my convocation address? Doesn't it unsettle us, these histories? But herein lies the problem. Interestingly enough, former President Jimmy Carter has been trying to make headways on the issue of gender. He's a member of a group called The Elders, a convening of older statesmen brought together by Nelson Mandela. And in that group, they try to offer wisdom and guidance to pressing world concerns from their years of experience, their kind of bird's eye view of history. And among the issues that they're attempting to address is the issue of gender discrimination. According to Carter, quote, at its most repugnant, the belief that women must be subjugated to the wishes of men excuses slavery, violence, forced prostitution, genital mutilation, and national laws that omit rape as a crime. In an article that he wrote about the role of religion in affirming many of these nefarious positions, he explains that, quote, the root of this injustice lies deep in our histories but its impact is felt every day. 
Other evidences are found in the denial of women fair access to education, health, employment, and influence within their own communities. Religion and tradition, he concludes, are powerful and sensitive areas to challenge, and yet challenge we must do. We need, a, need, a, we need a new way forward, and the only way to do that is by confronting the sanitized narratives of history that we like to recite in order to make ourselves comfortable and proud. History, as Trio concludes, is the quote, fruit of power, the ultimate mark of power may be its invisibility. Secondly, one of the things that we learned from women like Fannie Lou Hamer and great people of faith in their fight for justice is that we need the empathy that comes with 2020 vision. 2020 vision allows us to confront what's in the present, what's right in front of our very eyes. How do we experience the world around us? And even more importantly, how do we, how do the least of the, these experience the world around us? This too is a mandate of our faith, that we not only be concerned with our affairs, but that we be concerned with the affairs of others. Am I my brother's keeper? Am I my sister's keeper? And with the television, internet, Facebook, cell phones, you name it, how can we say that we don't know what's going on in the world? And so when I look around, I am both saddened and inspired by what I see with 2020 vision. When I think of 15 year old Malala Yousafzai, she's my 2012 heroine, who only wanted the opportunity to go to school who'd spoken out against the Taliban's refusal to allow girls to get an education and was shot in the back of the head on her way to school by a lone Taliban gunman. I am saddened, but I am inspired. Released from the hospital three weeks ago, she has awakened nations of people who champion her cause all because she refused to keep silent and she dared to tell her story, to write it, to share it, and to shake up a history and tradition that had long been working against her own choice for education and growth. When I look around me and I see the now seeming flood of reports of young women raped in India, the complete hatred and disregard for their persons and their bodies, I am overwhelmed. And yet the movement for justice that it is inspiring encourages me. When I look around me with 2020 vision and I see and I think about all of the young people who decided that they wanted to be connected with the rest of the world and they wanted fair leadership in their countries and thus launch the Arab Spring, I am inspired. And when I think about the over 60,000 college students who came to Atlanta for the Passion Conference just this past December and raised over $3 million to help combat systems of slavery that ensnare nearly 27 million people worldwide, I am inspired. And as Louis Giglio, Passion's founder, so clearly explained, he said, quote, you would have to be clueless and utterly blind not to realize that this is all about Jesus. And so if you notice anything about all of these major life-changing moments, they're all led by young people just like you. They see pain, they see injustice, and they respond. God at work in their lives, God at work in your lives. But you've got to look around and we've got to see and get involved. And finally, when I think not only do we need a full perspective of history and the empathy that comes with 2020 vision, we also need the hope of foresight. And here I'm not talking about the ability to predict the future. Only God knows that. But what I am talking about is what one dictionary definition says, and that is, quote, the ability to perceive the significance and nature of events before they occur. Justice is rarely a finished work. It's often a work in progress. We pursue it because we know that God's ultimate vision is as the prophet Amos recorded, that justice might roll down like a mighty river and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. Our responsibility is to get in where God is moving, 
Everything can seem impossible. The ability to stop human sex trafficking, the ability of young girls to feel safe in their own communities in India, the ability for young girls in various parts of the Middle East to go to school, the capacity to reverse the devastating effects of the prison industrial complex, the ability even to have peace in Sudan. But movements start with a vision, a vision of the possibilities by faith, a capacity to get to work where we are and with what we have and trust God for the outcome. Now, I've got work to do and you've got work to do because God has not called us to sit around and look cute, to simply get saved, to get a nice husband and a cute wife, to get a nice car, find 2.5 children and to retreat into our own sedentary lifestyles. God has actually called us to something greater. There's a world out there that he's called us to transform. He's called us to live a life in hot pursuit of righteousness and justice and to trust him for the outcome. And always remember, he who began a good work in you is faithful to complete it. God bless you.